But when you get down to it, it's all about relationship. First and foremost, with your Father, and then with those around you. And that's what Jesus says, the greatest command is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself. He boiled it down pretty good for us. He said, if you really want to keep my commands, put those, make that the most significant thing in your life. And do you hear that it is relationship? It's relationship. It's not about our stuff, our things, or even our events that we have planned in our life. If we have all kind of plans, I noticed on, I don't even know what network, I saw a commercial, I was was watching, fixing to watch uh, Charles Stanley this morning, and I put him on my office when I'm finishing up some stuff, and they're opening songs, I love their opening songs a lot of times, they've got this big orchestra and stuff, but you know, we didn't do too bad today with our small little orchestration, but it was good, and I listened to this big orchestration, this lady came out singing, I was like, yeah, it's good, and I was listening to Charles Johnson and revivers and different things, but as I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm listening, and I'm watching, before it came on, there was some television show that was being advertised, and it was basically uh, people... And I think it's just a television show. It's not one of those reality. But of this couple of people that they've been told they're going to die. And so they're going to start doing those things like if tomorrow's never going to come. And so the show is going to be around that. Now, I don't know if it's a live thing or anything else. But I got to thinking, isn't that interesting that when the trial hits, we, we have to peel everything else back. And we go, what is really important? Nobody on their deathbed says, boy, I wish I had more time to put in at work and be away from my family. Nobody says that. Nobody on their deathbed says, man, I, I'm going to go out tomorrow and I'm going to buy me some new toys. Now, there's a few people do that because they're like, I'm going to run up my credit card and just let everybody else pay for it when I'm gone. Nobody on their deathbed says those things that are temporal and say, I really want to do this, but we start looking at it and they say, really what I wish I could do is spend more time with my family. I really wish. That's the significant things we start finding. And it's built around relationships, isn't it? Or I wish that I could fix things a little differently now because what really matters is those significant things that's going to be more eternal. We chase the insignificant things in our lives as if they're significant only to find ourselves in the wilderness of our life. Now, sometimes we chase our own significance. You find the guy that's been faithful all these years and all of a sudden he decides I'm going to have an affair and he goes out and he starts chasing the most insignificant things of life and you find that once you're out there you're in a wilderness that it is hard to get back from or you find yourself that's in a position that you think well if I can just get to this corner office or this thing then I'll be somebody and you find when you finally get there that nobody really cares other than you and then sometimes that isn't really where God wanted you When you look at Hosea, and I'm going to turn here because what happens in all through the Bible is that God gave Israel the most green grass on all this planet. He gave them the most plush and the most beautiful place as the promised land. The only requirement he gave them was says, do not forget me. Do not turn aside from me. And he told Israel that. He says, look, I'm going, to, I'm going to set you up the most beautiful. You're going to be in such an awesome place. It says, just do not, and you remember those commands that Moses brought down, don't put any other gods before me. Just don't do that. You know, don't, don't lie. Don't do these things. And so you see, here's God. It's all about a relationship to us. His pursuit of us is what we find all through the scriptures right here. And you know, the scriptures are still being written today, and that scripture is where he has captured us. And what he is trying to do is continually to capture our heart, but we continually to chase those things that are so insignificant that really don't even matter to anything. And that's why in Hosea, you'll see where Hosea is told by God, he says, he he told Hosea the prophet, he says, go and marry a prostitute. Wow, what a, it won't work, guys. You can't go get the wild, wicked city woman and say, God's told me to. You're not a prophet. Don't do it. Hosea did. He told him, he said, go and marry a prostitute. So he found Gomer. Now, she's probably the worst of the worst, so the message is there. And he married her. And here she was. She'd become unfaithful and had three different children. And God told him what to name them, you know, Jezreel, and name them, not my child, not my people. Wow, isn't that great? Enter the first grade, you know, not my child. <laughs> this is wonderful. You go to school and you got that and that's, uh, that's hanging over your head. But here he was, he said, here's what I'm doing with Israel. 
And you'll see this in the first chapter of Hosea. And he's speaking to Hosea and he's telling him, he says, I'm going to use your life and I'm going to show a message here. And in this message, I want to tell the Israelites, I have given you the green grass of life, but yet you're looking across the fence as if there is greener grass. Why did God save you? Did he save you just so you can go to heaven or did he save you because he has promised you the blessings of this life and he promised you those good things but yet in our hearts and we find ourselves in our hearts that those things and that's where when I started this whole series on trials it's in James and we find out what's in our heart that sin's there and when sin gives birth it gives birth to more sin and when sin gives birth to more sin then it gives birth to death. That's that separation from God. Have you ever, I don't know if you've ever done this, you ever tried to live at a distance from God? You ever tried to keep your Christian walk intact and then you get what you find out when you start doing that, when you say, well, I'm just, I'm easing back on the gas pedal a little bit here and God, you know, I'm just gonna ease back some. And you'll find, here your friends come around and they say, what's wrong with you? Your light's kind of dim. What's going on with you? What's happening? Y'all, nothing, nothing. I'm doing fine. Everything's good. Then you start finding yourself, as you ease back from God, you'll find yourself, your options start opening up for other things. Things of the world, the insignificant things that really won't matter 10 years from now. And that's one thing a guy told me one time. He says, in all your activities, all the things that you put as such a priority, ask yourself, will it matter 10 years from now, what you're doing? Will that really matter? What you're so invested in that you pulled your pedal off from following God, you pulled your foot off the pedal from following God with all your heart, you pulled back and you said, mm, I'm just, I'm, I'm really weary, God. I want to go do this for a little while. And, and he would ask you, it's like, really? Is that that significant? Is it going to matter 10 years from now? Hosea, going back to him as a prophet, and he wanted to tell the Israelites, he's saying, look, what I have given you is everything that you need for life in God. And I have given you everything everything as a christian listen to me god has given us power over everything he has given us power over sin he's given us power over the death he's given us power in this life and he says the same power that raised christ from death is at work in you he says we're joint heirs with jesus christ he said he's called us to be overcomers he didn't call us to be just survivors so in our Christian walk, it's very parallel to what we see of Israel. He said, I've given you everything you need. All I'm asking you to do is to love me, to serve me. Keep this relationship intact. Keep your foot on the pedal as full go. Don't let up. What happens is Israel gets in there and they get settled. Then they start looking across the fence. Hmm, what they got? What is that? That looks good. Their God lets them do whatever they want to do. Their God of the people of the land, the Canaanites, says, don't follow their gods. Said, you got to get them out. You can't follow them. They're just worthless idols. They're made by man's hands. They, they make these idols, and, and they said, hmm, that looks good. The Israelites looking across the fence going, well, this grass is good, but look at that grass over there. That looks good. So when we meet up with Hosea and he marries Gomer, he said, this is what it's going to mean, that you're, you're going to marry an adulterous woman because that's what he saw Israel as, as one who has gone out to commit adultery. They looked at the green grass and they said, this is wonderful. Oh, we want this so badly. But the problem is when you want the green grass, you know what you get with the green grass. You can go, I'm going to be preaching in Mississippi here for too long. And they empty out what's left in the chicken coop, put in a big old container, put a little water in it, and they spread it across the field. And there's some green grass that grows there. Yeah, that's chicken leftovers out of the coop. And you know what really grows green grass is death and destruction. It can really grow. See, God has provided the lushness of a Christian walk, but yet we stand at the fence thinking, whoa, this is some good stuff. But we're standing there as what Hosea, it, when he married Gomer, Gomer's like, yeah, I'll marry you, but I will have all these other lovers also. The Bible says we can't be unequally yoked in this world. We can't hold on to one foot in this world and then one foot with God. Those two don't mix well. And so when he's looking at Gomer, he says, she is what Israel is. Yes, yeah, she was my betrothed. She was the one that I was engaged to. She was the one that I have provided this beautiful dowry that everything that she could ever imagine. Israel, all I do is ask you, don't look to the other side of the fence thinking it's going to be a beautiful life because it is not. If you choose to go that way, then what's going to happen is you're going to get all the curses that go with those gods. 
you get all the things that go with that. And see, the problem is, and I don't know if in, nobody in here, but let's just talk about the person down the street. The last time you left God, was it really that fun? Was it really that joyous? I mean, you kind of looked and you said, young people, there's going to be a lot of allurement out there. There's a lot of things that said, hey, just come do this. This is going to be fun. Yeah. And that's what I've, I've shared before. My friends, we never drank. Really, we didn't cuss. We didn't smoke. Didn't dip. Didn't go with girls who did. Girls, don't start dipping. That's just not good. But I remember holding one of my friend's head up out of his own vomit. After he chose, because the grass looked green out there. And we just never had done that. And I remember holding his head up and, and just to keep him from wallowing in his own stuff. And I'm thinking, this green grass is costing me a lot. This, because he loved God. He was with God. He knew God. But he left God. He pulled the pedal up just for a second. You know, you, you can't. You've got to go full out for God. If you pull the pedal up just for a second, ask David if it works that well. One second, when kings were supposed to go out and fight the battles, he stayed home, let up a little bit. I've done this every spring. I've gone out to battle. All the guys agree with me. Let me just stay back. It's not a big deal. This greener grass was on the rooftop not too far away called Bathsheba. This would be beautiful. This would be wonderful. Nobody will know. Everything's good. Mm, let the pedal up just a second. And then you find yourself in a destructive mode. Here's the Israelites. They actually look at the greener grass syndrome. They started worshiping other gods. They built their own idols. They started looking at this land, not what God had given them, not that place. Gomer was what was equal to Israel. Hosea, he was standing in that place of God. The adultery of, of, of Gomer and the chasing after her lovers is what they call it. That's all chapter one. Look in the greener grass. Now, you look at chapter 2, you said, he tells them this. He says, and this is a prophecy that Hosea has given. He says, rebuke your mother, rebuke her. She is not my wife. I am not her husband. The relationship is not there. Folks, I'll tell you, there's sometimes that we, it's us that bring the trials because we have looked at the greener grass thinking, boy, this is going to be good stuff. He said, let her remove the adulterous look from her face. Let the unfaithfulness between from between let the unfaithfulness from between her breasts. Otherwise, I will strip her naked and make her bare as the day she was born. He is telling the Israelites, he says, "You want these other gods? I love you so much that I'm going to strip everything away from you." This is before they went into exile. He said, "I will make her like a desert, turn her into parched land, slay her with thirst." Have you ever seen someone that's left the Lord and the thirst that they have for the world is insatiable? You cannot satisfy it. Now, like I say, I'm not talking to any of us because we're all squared away and everything's good. But I'm, I'm talking about when you have this fulfillment, as Jesus says, I'm the living water that will quench, that will be the one that brings that thirst to a quenching in your life. I'm the only thing that can quench that thirst. The living water, he was telling the, the Samaritan woman who was, by the way, a gomer type. As he was telling her, he says, I'm going to give you living water that's going to flow out of you like you have never been amazed with. And here's Israel. They said, boy, if I could just take a sip of that cistern over there, it won't hurt me, but if I could just take a sip of that. And God's telling us, says, because of your unfaithfulness, I'm going to take you and I'm going to make everything dry. I'm going to make a wilderness all around you. He, says, I, he goes on and says this. He says, I will not show my love to her children because they are children of adultery. Their mother has been unfaithful and has conceived them in disgrace. She said, I will go after lovers. Who will give me my food and my water, my wool, my linens, my oil, and my drink? Therefore, I will block her path with thorn bushes. I will wall her in so that she cannot find her way. Here's the, the shifting of the grace and the mercy of God. Here's what I have found many, many times. This is the working of God. If you want to watch something funny, there's a Christian comedian who does the pray in the hedge of thorns. Yeah, it's funny as can be. It messes this scripture up for us because we all pray to the hedge of thorns around somebody. But this hedge of thorns is basically, I'm going to protect you because I'm going to make all those lovers disinterested in you. 
I don't know if you've ever seen someone has left the Lord, the misery factor of their life is there. Woo-wee. They can't find enjoyment in anything. They find themselves in such misery, and it's not until they get to a place where everything is dry, everything is a wilderness. It says, she will chase after her lovers, but she will not catch them. She'll look for them. She will not find them. Then she will say, I will go back to my husband at first, and then I'll be better off. So what God's doing is saying, look, you're going to walk away. I love you so much. You can go. That's a love of God. I don't, and please hear me on this. God doesn't send anyone to hell. You understand that? People always want to argue that. How can God send anyone to hell? He does not. He stacks the odds against any one of us choosing. But we choose to be separated from God. You don't believe, I've seen it many times, even as a pastor. I have offered people the love of the Lord and Jesus Christ, and they said, no, I'm good with what I've got. And they slip off into eternity with that statement. I am good with what I've got. But the problem is, if you're good with what you've got and you're standing before God, the only thing that's going to get you into heaven is to have the advocate, the redeemer, Jesus Christ, as your lawyer pleading your case that your sins have been forgiven. Because if you've got to stand on your own, you're done. You're done. Your good works are not going to get you in. We look at it and we say, okay, God, here's our life. Here's what Hosea and Gomer are dealing with. And they walk through this. And and what God does, he loves us so much that he will allow us, and let me just put it this way, aloneness. You know, that's almost worse than anything. I'm not talking about loneliness, no, no. He will allow us aloneness. And he loves us so much that he will strip, there will be no enjoyment. He'll strip everything else around him. Even the alcoholic, you'll find that is so addicted to alcohol that the enjoyment is totally gone. It's been gone a long time ago. It's just a habit now. It's just a numbing process. There's no enjoyment. Any one of our lovers that we say, boy, this would be what would really make me happy. And God's saying, go after it. Go ahead. I love you so much, but it's become your aloneness. It's going to be that place of what I call the wilderness perspective, and it's that introspective place where we look at and we say, God, where are you? And then God shows up. Ask Moses. Where did he get on the backside of nowhere after he had ran from his really basically his calling, and he tried to do it in his own hands. He killed the Egyptian, buried him, and they said, are you going to, you know, the Israelites, they saw that. And, and so it's, he ran to the wilderness And at that wilderness experience, it was that place where he was being stripped down. It was a place of aloneness. He was on the backside of nowhere taking care of his father-in-law's sheep. And you'll find he met God. But it was only after he had been stripped down. There was nothing left. He He was out of options. He was out of anything. And if you've ever, and this is, and I'll say this for Moses, if you've ever had a call on your life and you don't get to fulfill that, that is a place of aloneness that you will never feel with anything else, ever, ever, ever. You've got to have that call fulfilled in your life. Here's Moses. He ran from God, but he found God in the wilderness. Gideon was another one of those that was hiding. And he was hiding from the enemy. He was hiding from things. The trials they were facing is every time they would have a harvest, you'd have the raiding bands of people come down, steal everything they had. So here he was threshing the wheat in a wine press. You don't do that. You get on a hillside so the chaff can be blown away. But he was threshing the wheat in a low spot in the, in the wine press. And that's where God found him is in a place of aloneness. It was his wilderness experience. He was doing whatever he could do to keep things going and stay alive. But then God God found him there. It wasn't even about him pursuing God. You'll find Daniel was another one of those where he had a time of aloneness. If you remember the story in the lion's den, what happens in that time of aloneness is a time of focus change. Elisha, one of my favorite stories is when he ran from Jezebel after Mount Carmel, he found a time of aloneness on the hillside. And as God showed him all the miraculous and all the works that were doing, it was in that aloneness that wilderness experience where he's totally stripped down that he truly found a revelation of God that was never he was never the same after that point 
Why is that aloneness so important? Why is that wilderness so important? Anytime that we go through trials, sometimes we go by our own making. I used Hosea and Gomer, and they were using Israel. Israel chose to leave God. God didn't choose to leave Israel. God judged them and says, you're going to go after other gods. I'm going to let you. I'm going to let you see what is really, your life is not going to be benefiting anything from that. You're going to be in bondage. They're going to take hold of you. They're going to destroy you. They're going to conquer this land in which I gave you. Understand, there's a lot of things that go with that. But I love you so much, I'll let you go. He let Moses run. He let anyone in the scriptures. You'll see he even allowed David. Probably there were others encouraging. Dave, come on, uh, let's go to war. No, nah, I'm good. I'm, I'm going to hang back this time. There's always that encouragement. But when we find in that place of aloneness, that wilderness experience, here's what I want you to see. There are things that turn at this point. Because we get tested and tried. I don't want to skip over this, but you remember Jesus even went through a time of aloneness, a wilderness experience. In that wilderness experience, in that time where there was nothing else around, that's when the enemy came and said, you know, do this, do that. And Jesus said, no, it is written, it is written. One of the ways to get out of this place. He told her this, he said this, he said, therefore, and this is the scripture we started with, because he goes through a bunch more. He says, I'll take away the grains, the ripens, the new wine when it's ready. I'll take back the wool and linen. He says, look, if you want that green grass, I'm going to strip down everything else you have. I'm going to make you so hungry that you're going to want. I'm going to strip everything else away. There will be nothing left. And so finally you may look back to me. You're going to be in such a wilderness, aloneness time that you're going to finally get your priorities in order. He goes on to say there in verse 14, Therefore I'm going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert. And listen to the next part and speak tenderly to her. I don't understand, I, you know, if, if we get to be God for a day, I don't know what you would change, but I would probably take away some of my free will. <laughs> That's not love. I couldn't say I love you and, and take away your free will. You have a choice. I love you so much. If I was God for a day and God does this, he said, I love you so much, but I want you to choose to love me. Be your choice. He can make us. We can be like the little ballerina that when you wind it up, she starts doing her dance because you just wind her up. She's in control. You're in control of that little ballerina. She dances it around until the stem is unwound. That's not what God's after. He's after a people that will love him by their choice. That's why he gave us that free will. He gave us that choice, but he wants us to follow him by choice. And so he looks at Israel and he says, look, your choice is here. I've given you the blessings, everything that you want, but you keep looking across this fence as if you're going to get something that I didn't give you, like I'm depriving you of something. Folks, how many times in our Christian walk do we do that to God? God, you kind of deprived me of that. What's the deal here? This person's got this. This person's got that. That's going on in that person's life. You're not doing anything for me. None of us will say that out publicly. But there have been times you felt that. We all have. Boy, this got this, this, this. this. I can't. He looks at Hosea, and he tells Hosea, he says, look, he says, this is, you're going to use your life as a type and shadow. I'm going to make Gomer's lover so disinterested in her that the only place she'll have to look is up. She won't want these things anymore. I want to change her want to's. And you know, that's what God does in your life. That's what he's done in my life. Even the apostle Paul says, let's pray for a sorrow unto salvation. He even turns to people over and says, look, I'm turning them over for the destruction of their flesh so their soul may be redeemed. That's kind of harsh, isn't it? No, it isn't. It's one of those things that God does. He says, okay, you really want that? Guess what? It's got its cost to it. You're going to find yourself alone in the wilderness, stripped down and naked. Good news. Good place to be. That's when you can look up at God. God, you're all I needed anyway. You're all I ever wanted anyway. My life has been reprioritized in a lot of ways. And there have been, you know, the way it gets prioritized, rechanged, is reset. It's when I get to that place and say, God, 
all this stuff that I thought I needed to make me happy, there is nothing but you. That's it. Here's what I want to tell you. If any of you are down in that wilderness place, you're in that point where you can't seem to get out. You may be stripped down at this point before we throw down the Job card and start going, man, I don't deserve this. I don't think I need this. I don't want this. Even Job had to repent in the end of his own pride. Even he had to go through a point of repentance. And you can look at the last chapters there. The friends didn't have it down. They didn't have all the... They kept saying, there's got to be something wrong, got to be something wrong. Finally, Job, all God was doing was deepening a relationship that Job needed with God. No matter how deep you are right now, God always wants you to go deeper. So, he's going to lure her to the desert, speak tenderly to her, give back the vineyards. He will take this valley of Achor, which means the valley of trouble, and make it a doorway of hope. Then she will sing as in the days of her youth, in the days she came up out of Egypt. Then, in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband and no longer be called my master. I will remove the bales from her lips. In other words, the idols from her lips. No longer will their names be invoked. In that day, I will make a covenant with them, with the beasts of the field, the birds there, and creatures to move along. And he goes on, he says, in that day, responds, declares the Lord, I will respond to the skies, the skies to the earth. The earth will respond to the grain, the new wine, the new oil. They will respond to Jezreel, a plant for herself in the land. I will show my love to the one not called, that called not my loved one. I will say to those, not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. Let me finish with this. If you ever experience a wilderness experience, it's probably one of the most alone times that you'll ever experience. Ask yourself why you're there. And if it is just a reprioritization, that's fine. If God's asking to reprioritize, thank him first and foremost. Start thanking him. Thank you, Lord, that you're helping me to focus upon you. If you find yourself in a wilderness experience, you first and foremost, thank you, Lord. Thank you. That's why the Bible says, count it all joy when you face diverse trials. Thank you, Lord, for getting me here because I know, even though I am as miserable as, as a summer afternoon in the hot south, sitting out in full sun, I'm as miserable as it gets. Ask Jonah how miserable you can get. Even though I'm as miserable as it gets, thank you, Lord, for bringing me here because I can see right now I've got a lot of things in my life that aren't that important, and I've taken my focus away from you. I am now focused upon you. The second thing is you start looking at the word just as Jesus did in the wilderness. You start looking at the word saying, God, according to your word, this is who I am. This is what you promised. That's where you find yourself finding that. And he promises to make our deserts bloom, our wilderness to prosper again. He promised them and says, I'm going to make the new wine again. I'm going to make the grain grow again. I'm going to make the earth produce again. This dry place, this desert place that I have lured you to I'm going to make it bloom again. Wow, how awesome is that? That's a God who loves us so much, who will allow us to be stripped down where there is nothing left because he pursues us. And again, everything's about relationship, not things, not the events that are so important for us that we forget God, not the insignificant things that we follow. Even as Gomer, she's like, I, to be happy, I've got to have all these lovers. And that's what Israel is doing. To be happy, I've got to have all these things. And God says, no, to truly have joy is me and me alone. That's the only place we can find joy. Learn how to praise him in the midst of the wilderness. Learn how to focus back on his word. And lastly, all he's asking for is for us to come out of his wilderness experience saying, you're my God. You're it. Strip me down to where everything is about you and you alone. Strip me down. It's just me and you, God. If you've ever never been bare before God, I mean, where you can't hide in your activities, you can't hide in your stuff, you can't, you can't get away from God because he loves you so much. And people ask me this, and I've had people ask me, how can God still love me? I walked away from him. Let me tell you something. He loved you when you were yet a sinner, and he saved you when you're even worse than what you are now when you walked away. He loved them so much. He says, you have committed adultery, Israel, but I am going to lure you back to me. Christians, listen to me. 
God's mercies are new every day. He wants to lure us back to him. He lets us go through the dry points of our life. He lets us go through the brokenness of our life. He lets us experience the wilderness and the aloneness. Why? So that he can lure us back to him. Don't chase the insignificant. Find what really matters. Find what really matters. And that is only God. Let's stand together. We're going to sing through more love, more power. As we do that, I just want to encourage you. If you're in a wilderness or time that you know, man, I'm in a, this spot that I can't seem to get out of. I'm not looking for the gross, negligent sin or nothing like that. Sometimes it's a place that God has brought us to in order for us to sense that wilderness, that aloneness, so we will cry out, you are my God. If you need to do that today, I'm going to invite you to do so. If you don't know Jesus Christ, the greatest thing you can do is to come to know Jesus Christ today because you're not going to get into heaven any other way than through Jesus Christ. There's no other way except for making him Savior and Lord of your life. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for luring us into this place so we can cry out to you strip away all the insignificant things all the things that really do not matter strip those things away so we may know you thank you for that father if i need prayer today i invite you to come